Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today to the BBCA webinar on writing the perfect treatment report. I'm Natalie Bongay, and I'll be to said talking through the, the do's and the don'ts of a good treatment report. Um, thank you for all joining me today. We have already 183 of you with us, um, ticking up as we go. So as always, um, you know, we're really appreciative of you um, supporting these webinars, but also it's a really good you know, indication with regards to your, you know, commitments keeping up to date. You know, this this um, um, topic of treatment reports, you know, it's not overly technical in terms of, you know, pest species and treatments and things like that. It's more about, you know, what, what you should be doing, what you should be delivering, what BBCA expects. Um, and it's going to form as a reminder for you, um, if, if anything else. But I'll go into the content of the uh, webinar in a moment. Just going to do my normal, um, you know, FYIs for you. So, um, actually, do you know what? Before we do uh, housekeeping, I just want to mention. So, in March, it's 22nd of March uh, next year, we've got PPC Live in Harrogate. So, hopefully, um, those of you that can attend, um, you've already registered. Those of you that maybe haven't registered yet, um, yeah, pop on there. And hopefully, if you can make the trip up there, it'd be a great event. It's all on our website. Um, That'd be great. And also we have a charity of the year is Dementia UK. So um, every year we, we decide which charity we'd like to support. And this year it's Dementia UK. Um, you know, you should have a pop up that will appear uh, partway through the webinar or towards the end when it's finished, um, which will take you to our um, Just Giving page. And anything you can spare would be amazing. But also, if you come to any of our live events and you see us there, we've got a table. We normally have some giveaways for you um, in relation to if you can just pop a bit of donation in that charity box that'd be amazing um so yeah that's good not to talk about future webinars too much because i know you're excited about this one but just so you know my next one in september 2nd of september i think it is um going to be talking about mouse control um and again with regards to that it's going to be focused a fair bit on you know problem solving um certainly behavioral resistance um is going to be a part of it so if you're interested in that tell your colleagues or your friends um and yeah please you know come along yourself as well um good okay so i always do the introduction just wait for as many people as possible to come on so my housekeeping bits can be heard by everybody um cpd points being one of the main things i get the questions for later on in the webinar so um it's one cpd point as usual if you are listening to this webinar um, after the event, so not live, you popped onto our website and downloaded the video, um, you still get a CPD point, but you're just gonna need to register it yourself. If you're here live today, as you know, you would have you know, put your CPD number in um, and once it's finished, we'll have a list of all of those that remained with us and we'll get those points added for you. But remember, you've got to stay with me. Um, that's good. Uh, again, lots of you here have probably been on these webinars a lot. Um, but some of you may be new. So as a reminder, we have um, an op opportunity for you to ask questions, which I can answer. Now, I'll be doing that at the end of the presentation. So anything that pops up during, I'm not going to see until the end. Um, please put the questions in there as you go through, as you think of them. There's a possibility you've got a question that actually I'm going to answer later on in the presentation. But it doesn't matter. If I have already answered it, I'll just state it when I get to the Q&As because I don't want you to forget. I don't want you to forget that important question that you've got. Uh, you know, as always with these webinars, I make you know the biggest effort I can to include all the things I think you want to know about and all the things that are um, important in terms of the topic we're discussing. But there's possibly you've got a question in your mind, something I haven't covered, and you're like, why didn't Natalie cover that? Just just ask the question, okay? Q&A box down the bottom of your screen might be at the top of your screen, depending on what device, but if you just hover over, you should see it pop up. So Q&A, just for questions to me about the presentation, okay? Because there is also a chat section, um, which I think maybe some of you uh, are using already, or um, you can see that Kat's put in some information about um, the webinar today. But in that chat section, if you have any technical issues, um, or you want to share some information, no marketing stuff, but if you're, if I'm talking about a particular topic and some of you have just got some general comments about it that you want to share with everybody here, not just me, then pop it in that um, that chat section. Um, but again, if I suddenly start disappearing or you can't hear me, um, I've got some technical support sat there um, and they'll they'll help, help you through and try and give you some ideas. 
And then final thing, uh, I've got a window open, it's quite warm today. So if you do hear some birds chirping in the background, um, hopefully it doesn't bother you. But yeah, if it's a massive issue and they're, they're too loud, then just, just let us know and I can always pop and close that window. Um, but I'm told that it's not, so okay. Good, I think that's it. Um, and we're all here. We've got 224 of you, 225 of you. So again, fantastic. Great to see those numbers in a busy time of the year as well. Massive commitment. So, and a hello to you, all of you in your vans out there uh, with your phone popped up eating your sandwiches. Um, I'm jealous you're eating. I'm going to do that afterwards. Okay, good. Um, let's get started. So I'm going to share my screen with you just so we can uh, get started. So I mentioned it briefly at the beginning. Um, let me, sorry, I'm in the way. I don't want to see myself too much. There we go. Um, so this webinar, it, it, it's, for any, it's going to be really useful for those that are new to the industry, brand new, or maybe been around for a little while. Maybe some of your employers have taken you through treatment reports and what you do and why you do it. But you just maybe wanted a little bit more information on it. This is going to be really useful to you. There's going to be lots of information um lots of different things you need to do um so yes it's really useful for you and those um i was just speaking to um a good colleague friend of mine in the industry this morning um uh waving at you you know who you are and and yeah we were just talking about that doesn't matter how long you've been in the industry in terms of treatment reports we could could have written four thousand in your time four million in your time but actually there might be things you're not recording there there might be things that you're not thinking about writing down and hopefully um, today you'll um, you know that will spark an interest in you and you can go and redevelop things and um, you know make those those reports better so so yeah it's for everybody it's going to be useful for everybody okay good so I think we're ready to rock and roll so just to um, go over quickly what we're going to cover today again to manage your expectations um, we have uh, you know what a treatment report is you might think well, I know what one is Natalie but you know just to go over it why we do a treatment report, a code of best practice that BPCA have, um, go through, uh, through some of those points, and then also what's the best way to do a treatment report. Okay, they're the topics we're going to cover today. Anything that maybe you think, oh, I thought Natalie was going to do X, Y, Z, just let me know in chat, uh, sorry, Q&As. And um, if I don't have time to go over it, anything you ask at the end, as always, um, I'll uh, get back to you all afterwards. Okay, or maybe we'll do another webinar. Okay, <clears throat> so first off, though, we're going to do a bit of a question time, a bit of a poll. So all of you sat there relaxing with your arms behind your head, you make yourself comfortable. We're going to pop up two questions. Um, and it's just really give me an idea and everybody here an idea of the things that you do and you don't do. So hopefully there's no issue with the um, polls coming up. Uh, yeah, I can, can I see it there. Are we able to share that? Oh, there we go, Kat. Thank you. So do you complete a treatment report for every visit you make? Every visit. So yes, every single visit. No, I don't do treatment reports or most visits, but not all of them. So if you can select the one that's most appropriate for you. Um, as I said, there's 238 of us here. So I'm just going to give you a bit of time to reach for your screens. <clears throat> Because um, it's just a, it's an interesting question, this one, because I do talk to members quite a lot about treatment reports, um, as do, you know, um, our BPCA assessments. And it's, it can be a variety of, of answers. But I just want to see if you guys is all anonymous as well. So, you know, um, you know, no judgment or anything, but just like to know um, if you do that. So great. 81 percent of you. Yes. Every single visit. And hopefully that includes visits that. Um, aren't just because you put pesticide down. Hopefully it's regardless of what you've done. Even if you've just gone and done a survey um, and someone's, you know, said to you, um, you know, um, you kind of walk away from that waiting for other visits to happen or uh, your customer to accept the survey or, you know, hopefully you're recording that as well. You know, everything you're doing, you should be recording. And we'll go into why that's important in a moment. Um, uh, only 1% of you know you don't do treatment reports. So great. I'm glad you've logged on today. You know, hopefully I can convince you otherwise that, you know, you should be doing them and why it's important for you, um, whether you're a business or an employee, um, why you should be doing them. Um, you know, it's not just something that should be seen as a, oh, God, why do I have to do that? Um, hopefully you'll be excited afterwards. Uh, and then 18% of you, most visits, but not all. So, yeah, I do. We do find that sometimes when we're talking to members. They say, well, yeah, I 
do a treatment report maybe the first visit and the last visit or I do a treatment report um you know only if I'm using pesticides and, and things like that which can be quite common so again good to see that you know most of you yep every single visit and those of you that don't or don't always do it this webinar is perfect for you so welcome to you okay last question um, which we will pop up Um, so, yeah, who gets a copy of your treatment report if you have, say, a landline, a landlord and an occupier? So you get called out, whatever pest it is, and you're doing the work in a tenanted property with a tenant there. But actually, it's the landlord that's paying for that work. OK, so do you get, do you have a copy for just you and the tenant? Do you have one for you and the landlord only and not the tenant? Do you do one for all of you? So yourself, the tenant and the landlord, they will get a copy. Or maybe it's just you. Um, there might be an option on there where I haven't added. Maybe you say, I don't give anyone anything, Natalie, including myself. Um, but maybe just put just me if that's the case. OK, so pick the one that's most relevant to you. And this all reflects the things that we talk to members about quite a lot. Have a moment to listen to the birds. I think they've stopped now, actually. There we go. Good results. So what well, a mixture then. Um, so the I say the correct answer. This is the correct one. You'll see why. But 54% um, uh, of you say me, the tenant and the landlord. That is what BPCA wants. That's what BPCA expects. And um, again, I'll go into more detail with that, but also protects you. So that is that's 54%. I'm glad most of you do that. Um, uh, some of you, so me and the landlord, 25%, uh, me and the tenant, 18%, and then just me, 2%. So there's still a few of you that, you know, maybe don't give any paperwork um, at all. And I'm assuming maybe some of those, it's, you know, even you don't have it for yourself. So again, hopefully this webinar will will convince you that, oh, I should be doing that. Um, and then everyone else that's not doing that 54% of, you know, treatment for everybody, hopefully I'll convince you otherwise. Okay, if I don't. Just saying that you didn't convince me. I'm going to come and see you. OK, um, great. So let's get going then. That's question time done. Very exciting. Um, and thank you for that information. It's good for me to confirm it. So what is a treatment report then? Of course, we know what a treatment report is. But, you know, the, the reports are utilised in many sectors of business, including, you know, electrical, plumbing, medicine, you know, medicine. They have to do medical reports, building, maintenance work. You know, and also as a pest professional, we deliver a service. So and to many different types of businesses and residents. And it's really important that we record you know, the good work that we do to demonstrate that we have delivered the agreed service. Um, you know, if you're, you're doing a good job, you want to be able to write it down somewhere and prove that you've done that. Um, and it can also be a good tool to measure performance. Now, whether you're a sole trader or you're a manager within a business or you're a technician within a business, you know, treatment reports reflect on the work that an individual is doing. Um, now, it's not just the technical content, i.e. I've put, you know, baits here or I've put traps there or I've done this, you know, given this recommendation. It's not just about the technical content. It's about the way it's written, the handwriting. You know, could the handwriting be a bit better? Because it's got to be legible, hasn't it? So in terms of measuring performance, if you're doing reviews of, with um, your staff, or even as a technician, you might sort of go back to your reports and think, actually, I'm going to go and have a look at them and just see whether or not my performance in terms of the way I'm writing reports is actually of a good standard. So, you know, again, is your handwriting clear? Because remember, someone else is reading this report. It's not for you. It is for you to a degree, but actually it's really useful for um, you know, your customers and necessary for your customers. So good handwriting, um, you know, you're separating the details. You can see in this treatment report example here, which is available for download for BBCA members. It's a template we created. Um, you know, it's all sectioned out. I'm not saying you have to do that. You can have whatever template you want. Um, but is it clear? Can you clearly see, you know, the risk assessment bit? Can you see the actions you've carried out? Can you see, is it all separated out so that a customer isn't having to read a big block of text that's maybe bad handwriting, trying to pick out the information that they need? Um, so, you know, think about those things. You can measure the performance of employees, for example, and discuss about, OK, let's, you know, get you some uh, you know, handwriting lessons, maybe. It's happened. Done that with someone before. We have fun doing it as well. My handwriting can be pretty poor sometimes, but I've managed to make it clearer with regards to, you know, delivering information to people and let them read it better. So 
So there's a good thing there. Lots of industries do them. Um, you know, it's a good way to, you know, share the things that you're doing. Um, and also it's a tool to, you know, uh, measure performance. So that's really what a treatment report is. Um, and, you know, you can do it electronic or paper. Again, this is a paper version here. You can see um, this example. But we are utilising electronic reporting a lot more now. And do you know what? There's a lot more opportunity in terms of the information that you can share with customers. Usually you can add photographs. Um, you know, you can put more information in there. If there's a, an ability to type rather than just tick boxes, different systems work for different people. Please don't ask me what system I recommend um, because I won't be able to tell you. There's so many out there. There's apps and there's systems and there's um, things you can build. And uh, yeah, I'm not the one to ask. Certainly, we did do a, an article magazine on it before. Again, we could share you with that, um, but I'm not going to tell you now which system we recommend. But yeah, we are seeing a lot more. Um, but again, you can also use paper. There's no issue with using paper if that's your preferred method. Um, again, it's just getting getting that template right. So you can share all the right information. OK. Um, it'd be interesting to hear how many of you are using electronic reporting and how many are not. So um, please, again, share that with each other in the chat section, by all means. Um, no problem at all. So why do we do treatment reports then? Um, firstly, actually, the main thing I'll say is why would you not do a treatment report? Um, you know, whether you're a business owner or an employee, the reports that you write reflect on you as a professional pest controller. You know, the customer can see the actions you have taken. You know, remember, it's you that uh, the customer sees representing the business. What you do in terms of your reporting is a direct reflection on you as a professional. Um, as an individual, I remember when I uh, you know, first started out in the industry and even when I've been in the industry for 10, 12, 13 years, still going out and about and doing treatment reports. You know, that not only is that a reflection of me, and what the information I put in there, this, the quality of information I put in there is a reflection of me. But that report is going to be in a site folder or in a customer's drawer for as long as the paper exists. OK, they may put it in the bin at some point or do some, um, you know, file control or whatever. But that, that report is going to be hanging around for a long time. So your customers can see it. Your competitors can see it. Um, auditors can see it. You know, it's a reflection of you and the work you do. Um, I've been there when I first started out, I'll tell you a brief, you know, routine visit carried out, a few words, you know, I'm busy, I need to run off and you don't put that much information in there. It's tempting to do and it's easy to forget the importance of that treatment report, but you really do need to build that into your time allowance, okay, to be able to sit down and write a good treatment report. It doesn't need to be war and peace, of course, but um, we'll go into that a little bit more, but it's, it's, just, it's professional. That's the key. If we want to be called professionals, we need to do professional things and uh, providing good documentation of the professional things you're doing is a massive part of it. OK. Um, and it protects your business. So, um, you know, this is oh, it protects your business in many ways, you know, be it reputation, um, be it uh, legal or civil issues. I'm going to go into that in a, in a bit more now. This is just a quick reflection. but it protects your business in many different ways. Um, and again, I'm gonna talk about that a bit more in a moment. Marketing and communications. Again, like I said, that piece of paper or that electronic um, uh, copy of the report that you've emailed to your customer, that's gonna be around for some time. And it's gonna be very visible to possibly a whole bunch of different types of people. So, you know, make sure you utilize it, you know, get some good um, branding and, and marketing and communications information on there. Um, a legal requirement. Again, legal requirement, I'll go into that. It certainly can be and will be and has been in the past used in courts of law and things like that. Um, and also, more importantly, for you, for those of you that are BPCA members, it is part of our criteria that you do a treatment report. We have a code of best practice, which I'm going to go through the most important points that we have in there and in what you need to be doing. And um, yeah, if you're a BPCA member, you do need to be adhering to that code of practice. If after this you go and have a, I'm going to share some extra reading ideas for you, but um, if you do go and read our code of best practice, you think, oh, actually, I haven't seen that or haven't looked at it for a while, and you go through it, remember that's CPD as well. Um, so, you know, record your CPD points on any sort of extra reading that you do relating to this webinar. OK, so it's one point today. You might think, oh, one point. Is that it, Natalie? But actually, 
you may go and do some research elsewhere to find some information on the things I mentioned. Or CPD, you just need to record it yourself. Okay, so you say criteria. So let's look at that in more detail. Um, so, like I mentioned, I did go on a bit, didn't I? You all know me by now, hopefully. And if you don't, you'll get to know me. Um, I can go off on a tangent and get excited. And professionalism is one of those areas I get very excited about because um, oh, I remember the days, you know, oh, Italy's here. Oh, it's the rat lady or the bed bug lady. And oh, your job looks easy. You know, from an outside perspective, they feel that, you know, our, our, our industry is not necessarily seen as, um, you know, professional. It's strange. That is changing. That is certainly not the case anymore. Um, but it's still hanging around a little bit. But being professional, you're the ones that are responsible for creating a professional image of this industry. OK, we can help you do that. We try and you know, develop standards to help you do that. Um, but ultimately, you're the ones out there delivering the service to customers and creating that impression. OK, so, um, you know, the service you're providing is based on expertise. It's not I'm checking a box. Or I'm just, you know, spraying a can of aerosol to kill them flies or whatever. You've got expertise. You know, you know what you're looking for. You know the biology of the pest. You, you know, you know the, the legislation around the products and what you can do and can't do and keeping people safe and dealing with problems effectively. You know, your service is based on expertise. So remember your professional and promote your professional and do good reports that prove your professional. Um, you know, that, that that's the key thing, really. And it provides reassurance to your customer. You know, we know pest uh, problems are a real emotive issue and um, they get really upset. I think everybody here, unless you're really new to the industry, everybody here has probably experienced somebody crying on the phone to them before or, you know, upset in a, you know extreme way. And that's because pests can be emotive and there's lots of fears associated with them. So, again, you know, um, giving good information to customers once you've dealt with that issue that they've been so fearful of um, can give them some reassurance after the event. You know, when you've gone and they've calmed down a bit, they've got some information there that they can read. So lots of reasons to do it. But, you know, the, the, the tagline is it's professional. Um, like I mentioned about marketing communications, I'm not a marketing and communications expert. I know Kat, who's supporting me uh, at the moment, and Harrison, they'll be like, no, Natalie, you're really not an expert in marketing and communications. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly we can help you if you need any advice or, you, or you, maybe you developed your own treatment report or electronic treatment report. And you think, oh, could this be a bit more eye catching? You know, could I add something to it that could actually, you know, make my company pop a little bit more, my profile? Um, then I'm sure uh, the marketing team would be happy to have a look at that for you. Um, but yeah, use your branding. Get, make sure your logos are on there. Make sure it's clear. Make sure your contact details on there. It's almost like a little business card, isn't it, um, that you have in, in your folder. Certainly if you're dealing with residential properties, you know, domestic customers, I've got a lot of friends. Ooh, maybe some of them have got a lot of friends. They're making assumptions. But, you know, they have people around them. So if a friend comes to them, got a pest issue, no worries. Hang on a minute. Where's that treatment report? Here's, you know, Natalie's bug control or whatever. Give her a call. She's great. Um, so you utilize it as a, as a marketing tool as well. And of course, if you're a BBC member, get the BBC logo on there. If you're not a BBC member, you put our logo on your report. We will tell you off. I'll come after you. Um, or I'll just say, if you join us now, we might let you off. OK, uh, but no, obviously, if you're a BBC member, you can use the logo. If not, then um, we'll join us. Solve the problem, isn't it? Um, good. OK, so also protect your business. So, um, you know, we mentioned obviously legal requirement, which kind of ties in a little bit with this, but just more specifically about protecting your business. Civil claims. Um, if somebody feels, for example, maybe you damage something. Heat treatments is a big one where, you know, maybe windows bow or they feel that you've damaged a picture frame on their wall or, um, you know, you sprayed something and stained it or you know, if they feel that you've caused damage, there could be a civil claim. Um, and, you know, you're going to need backup for that, for you to be able to defend yourself. He said, she said, it's not going to necessarily work. Believe me, they'll have all the records that they possibly can. Um, uh, not necessarily a treatment report. But if you've given them a treatment report and you've got a copy of it and it's got a signature on there and it's got the information about, you know, what you've done, how you've done it, that you followed everything properly. And actually, this isn't this isn't something you can, you know, claim against me because, look, it's all written here and you've signed it. You're protecting yourself. OK, 
it's you know there can always be still be issue treatment reports not going to solve all problems but it's part of your protection okay um and the same goes for criminal prosecution i don't know um a, a dog eats some poison that you uh, have apparently put down again I've, I've had situations or complaints about the poisoning of um of dogs through eating poison that a pest controller has put down um and it's the paperwork that actually helps us help the members and say well actually what you say your dog has eaten is not what's on this treatment report and also the area and locations of where that was put is not on this treatment report and you know yourself and the you know the pest control have signed it you, you've acknowledged it you said you'll keep your dogs out of the garden which you didn't um all these this treatment report helps you protect yourself if there's any issues like that so again um utilize it in the best way that you can we'll look at the sorts of things you can put in there um reputation all of the things I mentioned above really um, will come down to reputation, but also again, if you um, uh, people can see the work you're doing, that's I mean, you know, it's a good treatment report and a, a good tool for for me to have as a customer to be able to look back on the work you've done. So good for your reputation. And like I mentioned, um, uh, you know, VPCA, we deal with complaints, or I deal with complaints. Um, first thing I do if I get a complaint about a member is, you know, let's have a look at your treatment reports. Where's your treatment reports? Um, and again, sometimes that's where a lot of these issues can can arise when there's a complaint, but there's no record of what the um, pest control has done. It's very difficult to help defend them or, or improve the service, you know, improve the things that you maybe aren't doing. We're there to help with that. OK. Um, I notice I'm, I'm going along with time here. I'm going to have to move on a little bit quicker. But I think I've got you. Yeah, those those areas there are really important. Um, and moving on to the next really important bit, the legal requirement that I mentioned. So some of you may say, well, what legislation says that I have to do it? Of course, it's not a bit of legislation that says, you know, pest controllers shall, you know, write a treatment report on every visit. You know, we have a code that says that. Um, but within the legal framework, the best place to really look is the, the posh, uh, control of substances hazardous to health 2002 regulation three um and the words that it uses so in that box you can see at the bottom of all that sorry, not box that circle that speech bubble you know the, the 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 term is the words that are used within that cross regulation is you know so far as is reasonably practicable um you have a duty of care in respect of any other person whether they're at work or not so again your customers and people around that might be affected by your work um you have a responsibility, you have a duty of care and to respect to keeping them safe, to giving them information. Um, so, you know, you've got to supply pesticide information, you know, because that could affect the people around you. Or well, if you're doing something to protect the people around you, write it down, you know, because um, if you don't, you're not going to be able to protect yourself if you were to um, go and fall abroad. There's, there's, you know, things like the Consumer Rights Act as well, that could be part of the legal requirement. But I just wanted to focus on the um the cost stuff you may say well if i'm just using traps and maybe i don't need to do one but that would again come down to bpca code of practice if you're a bpca member and if you're not a bpca member um and you're not using pesticides then certainly things like the consumer rights act if someone felt that you hadn't delivered a service effectively enough um, and they wanted to put a civil claim in against you and say you know i paid 200 pounds for this work it hasn't been done properly i want my money back if they were to take it to a, a civil court you need to be able to, you know, um, protect yourself. And if you haven't got that paperwork there to say, I did do this work, then you may have to provide things like refunds and fines or whatever for I don't know, all the all the routes that they can go through in the courts. But, you know, there are legal requirements. OK, so pesticide or not. OK, so going on to the BBCA code of best practice. Um, again, it's there for you all to read. I'm having a little review of it at the moment. Um, I don't think there's anything majorly in there that we need to change. Um, most of it will stay the same. I just might, um, you know, make, uh, <laughs> make my vocabulary be better. But these are all the important points that are in there. So our codes of practice are not long documents. They're usually a maximum of three pages. And we tell you, the reason we're writing that code of practice, the legislation that might be associated with the topic of that code of practice, and then we'll do a do's and a don'ts. OK, it's usually uh, a one to whatever list, a numbered list. Um, and it says very briefly, these are things you must or mustn't do. So one of the first one, I've mentioned it already. A lot of these I've probably mentioned already. But again, just to describe to you as a BPA member, the things you do need to adhere to. Um, and also these codes. 
they're, they're industry codes of best practice. They're not approved codes of best practice, but they are industry. Now, courts of law can still use them. Um, even if you're not a BBCA member, they can still go to them and say, well, actually, you know, this is an industry standard. Um, and these are things that should be done. And it, and it can have some influence, I'm told. You know, I'm told by, um, you know, consultants and um, uh, legal um, professionals out there that they can be used. So, again, uh, I've gone off on a tangent there, but important for you to understand that. So every visit you carry out, you must complete a detailed report and leave a copy with the customer. OK, that's our wording in the code of practice. There's no, there's no you know, fluffing around the edges. You know, every visit you carry out, you must complete a detailed report and leave it. I want to say detailed. You know, there's no uh, measure on that. You make a judgment on it. But think about the things that you've done and go, OK, the customer needs to know about this. The things you may talk to them about, about what you've done, because hopefully verbally you're talking to them as well. You're not just shoving the report in their hands and doing a runner. Um, hopefully you're talking to them about it as well. You know, get it written down, you know, duplicate that so you've got that evidence. Because um, again, he said, she said is not necessarily going to work. So every visit you must do one. Um, if you have multiple customers, so like we've done in the poll at the beginning, tenant or landlord, you must ensure that the occupier of the premises has detail on the actions taken and the pesticides used. Now, you'll notice that we say the, the tenant, the occupier of that property. Now, whether you give your, um, uh, you know, the paying customer one or not is up to you. Now, we do obviously recommend that um, and you will. I'm sure they'll want one. Um, but in terms of the, the safety side of things, the legal requirement side of things, you know, the person that's in that property, the person that's being directly affected, those other people that the cost uh, regulations mention will be that person in that property, not your landlord. Your landlord's not there. The landlord's not necessarily been affected by it. He or she does still need to know, not your landlord, sorry, the, the property's landlord. They still need to know what's happened. But real important one is for that tenant there, because whether it's traps or whether it's a uh, pesticide or whether um, it's just monitoring you're doing or whether it's recommendations you've given, um, you do need to make them aware of it. And I know there's going to be some questions around, but what if my landlord doesn't want me to? Um, if there is that question, I'll answer it because um, I'm noticing, again, Natalie style, uh, we're, we're, we're starting to run out of time. OK, so um, uh, is my mouse gone. OK, so the next one. Um, information on the chemicals used must be provided. Again, active ingredients, trade name, quantity and the location of it, okay? Um, active ingredient being one of the most important things, don't just use trade names. They don't necessarily mean anything to anyone. There could be different trade names or could be different active ingredients under that one trade name. You know, make sure you use active ingredients, make sure you put the quantities and locations where it is. And also add the trade name because it is useful. The more information you can have on a product, the better, okay? But as a minimum, BBC members need to be providing this information. Uh, so another few do's and don'ts. Uh, again, non-negotiable for members. Any recommendations for hygiene, proofing, housekeeping, you must record on there. Okay. Again, this is all about professionalism. You know, our your BPCA is all about professionalism. That is our main tagline. And uh, recording the recommendations you're given, you know, clear that mess up or seal that hole over there. Um, you know, don't do this, don't do that. Instructions you need for your customer to follow, you need to write them down, okay? Um, and they must be dated, of course, straightforward stuff. Um, and again, important, the technician's name, whoever's carrying out the work, we want that on there um, and a signature. And also it must be legible. Like I mentioned, handwriting is a thing. I mean, I haven't got, I don't know, yeah, handwriting, not, not the best handwriting in the world, but I think it's legible. Have a little test. Maybe, uh, you know, again, this is sort of fun stuff that I used to do. And you know, I'd write out a, a treatment report, like a mock one. I was having a team meeting with the guys and girls. And uh, I'd be like, right, can everybody read that? And I'd go around the group. And, you know, if there was anybody that says, oh, actually, no, no, I can't read that bit there. Or I'm not quite sure that active ingredient says, then I would have to adjust the way I'm writing it. Take more time to write it. Get an electronic reporting system so that you don't have to worry about what your handwriting is like. Um, so, yeah, important. Must be legible, and you know the uh, uh, grammar used or the, the the language used understandable. So, um, again, of course, we need to put active ingredients uh, with regards to the pesticides we're using, but don't use too much technical jargon on treatment reports because 
again, it's a lay it's lay people that we're 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 giving these reports to. So um, even though it's good to have that in depth technical or um, you know terms in there, maybe just elaborate on them if uh, you are tempted to use them. Of course, things like biologist reports, you're going to be very technical, and that's expected. Um, so reports must have a customer signature and electronic confirmation of some description which shows they've read and understood it. I know there's problems, there can be problems with it, whether it was COVID stuff where they didn't want to touch or sign the reports. Um, it might be work on a very remote area where the customer um, is not actually on site. But again, technology, um, be it take a photograph of it with your phone and email it to them or be it, <clears throat> um, you know, well, that, that's it really. Or if you've got an electronic system that can usually send it to them as well. And you've got that proof there. And this is all about protecting you. It really is. But providing the customer with information, providing them with a good service and protecting you and proving the work that you've done. All right. Um, a few more do's and don'ts. Um, so uh, we've got a couple more after this. So post-treatment requir requirements must be included within the report. Um, so again, you might say, don't vacuum for four hours or two weeks or two days or whatever. Um, um, you know, don't touch that thing over there. Don't let the dog in over there, whatever. You know, but post-treatment requirements should be um, within your treatment report. Um, warnings obviously must be discussed and recorded with your customer. You know, make sure you discuss them with them as well verbally. You know, the, the warnings or the safety information and post-treatment information, it's really important that you discuss that and also record it, um, record it down. Of course, things like keeping out the, you know, if you if you don't write down the, the safety instructions you're giving your customer and then you go away, something happens, you know, they try and get you in trouble for it. And you're like, I told you not to do I told you not to eat that thing. Um, but they did eat it. If you can't prove you didn't tell them not to eat it, then um, you're probably going to um, come a cropper in court if they try to do it. Um, hopefully none of these things happen to you, but it can. You know, I'm not a glasses half empty sort of person. But I like to you know, prepare my my my, my life and my work in, in a way of, you know, if that thing happened, so I've got this report that, that protects me and says I did do the things that um, uh, I tried to, you know, prevent. Okay. Um, any relevant follow-up information, of course, put that on the report so your customer has got expectations, you know, they've got them managing their expectations. It's one of my favourite terms. Some of you will be smiling to yourself going, yes, Natalie, you say that every time. Um, but yeah, customers know what they're going to you know, receive, then they're happy. And you want happy customers, of course. Um, some advisory bits that are actually in the code um, in terms of what, and this is advisory, and it says in there, this is advisory. It's not, you know, um, necessary for every customer and you can choose other when you do it. But we do have some uh, extra information in terms of different pests. We've got leaflets. You might have leaflets. It's always good, isn't it? Especially things like bed bugs um, or, you know, fleas, you know, those issues that cause a lot of frustration for people. You've got a treatment for them. If you've got a nice information leaflet on them as well that you can give to them, great marketing tool and great information for the customer. It makes them feel oh, a bit more secure and extra information they can read after the event. Um, we have these um, all available for BPSA members to download. So please do utilise it um, if you are. And again, if you're if you're not a member, um, checks are payable to Natalie. Uh, I need to do strong that bit. Um, yeah, just uh, join as a member and you can get them. Or yeah, it's an idea for you to maybe develop some yourself. Uh, just as I said, further reading. Um, again, uh, we've got a treatment report template. Uh, we've got guidance on site folder contents. It's all sort of related to treatment reports. Um, in terms of legislation, the vast subtle product regulations, the control of pesticide regulations, these are just good things to be aware of. And like I mentioned, we're encouraging this further reading to encourage you to go and look at it, look, you know, understand it. And bonus, you'll get some CPD points. You just record it with the relevant scheme that you're with. And remember, anything you do extra reading on you can get points. You just need to tell someone about it. OK, and of course, health and safety at work at control of substances, hazardous to health and animal welfare, possibly as well, because these are all bits of, again, I went into mostly the cost stuff, but animal welfare, if you say set some traps for, you know, some spring traps for a, a particular pest that you're dealing with and you put it in a, you know, a tunnel that, you know, prevents them from coming at it from an angle, they shouldn't come at it. And that's all to do with humane dispatch and so on and so forth. Um, and someone accuses you of not doing that, then you can have that treatment report that, proves and records that 
you did take those precautions, you know, spring trap set within tunnel, placed in a way as to not cause um, any harm or inhumane um, catches of the target pest. You know, these sorts of words, it protects you. You've got to think, you know, what someone tries to, where well, there's blame, there's a claim, isn't there? Okay, good. So what's the best way to do a treatment report? Um, I mean, you know, there isn't one way. Um, certainly utilising the report as, as, as much as possible um, is something that you're doing every day or it's an electronic system that you've invested in. So utilise the blooming thing. Um, can you do risk assessing on it? The, I don't know if you remember the image at the beginning of the treatment report that BBCA uh, provide members if they want it. Um, at the top, there's a little risk assessment tick box. Only a little tick box, but again, it demonstrates that you're doing something. But if you do have any type of risk assessing, be it environmental risk assessing or health and safety risk assessing, I've said assessing quite a lot, haven't I? Yeah, I don't know, anyway, it doesn't mean anything to me anymore, that word. <laughs> so if you're doing those things, just make sure it's not just tick box. Oh, yes, I've considered pets and I've considered non-target animals and I've considered water courses. That's great, wonderful. But have you how have you mitigated those risks? Don't just tick that you've thought about them. If you're going to demonstrate that you've thought about them, just have a little area that says what you've done. You know, OK, yeah, there's pets here. This is the information I've given to the customer with regards to keeping that pet safe. Don't let them in that property. Because again, these are things that the customer will sign, you will sign. And if anything went wrong and they did let them in that area that they told you that they wouldn't be in, um, you can say, well, I'm not liable. OK, that is an example that's happened in the not too far past. Um, uh, and there was no treatment report to protect that, that pest controller. And um, I don't know what happened in the end, but yeah, I think there was... Some issues, but anyway, get it in there. If you're going to do risk assessing or environmental risk assessing, just make sure you've got those mitigation measures. I'm not going to talk about environmental risk assessing in detail. Very tempting, uh, but there there are webinars available on environmental risk assessing. Okay. Um, so the best way again to do these treatment reports, just make sure you have all the relevant information fields. Of course, again, if you you've got an electronic system or any other way you might think oh well, i've got more than that natalie wow brilliant but as a minimum you know you need to have the customer information on there the the dates and the times have you got survey in there again you might call it survey or you might call it findings um call it whatever you want but information on i've had a look round. this is what i found um and then below that this is what i'm going to do okay so survey is just as important as actions um, of course, the locations that you've placed anything that's going to be dealing with the pest um, in, in, in question, safety advice, absolutely have these things separated out. Don't have it all in you know one big block of information that's, you know, survey and actions and safety advice and pesticide information all in one box. It, it's just confusing. You know, customers don't know what bromodialone is necessarily or you know, permethrin or deltamethrin or kumatetrol or whatever. They don't know what all these words mean. So you separate it out into a box that says pesticide information and they can go directly to it. Oh, right. This is the chemical used. Great. OK. Um, and of course, signatures at the bottom. Um, oh, a little tip there, a little bit of animation there. Not my fancy handiwork. <laughs> Good. So. And just a few more slides here and then we'll get on to some uh, questions. I can see there's three in there. Um, another important bit, don't don't um, overcrowd your treatment report. Uh, I, I mean, it was fantastic thinking and I love the ethics and ethos behind it. But, you know, I've been with uh, members before and they go, Natalie, this treatment report, you know, it's maybe two pages long. They've got all this information in there. They've got safety data sheets in there. They've got almost like a pack of information to give their customers. Um, and it's all kind of tied in together. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be doing that. Absolutely not. But just remember that treatment report, it's a lay person reading it. Um, you know, the more information you provide, it can sometimes start slipping over that line of it being a good treatment report into a, oh, I don't want to read that. That's too much. OK, so, you, you know, you want to have, you want to get that sort of sweet point. There's no you know, 100 words, 50 words, 1,000 words. There's no uh, guide we give you in terms of that. You know, use your common sense with it. But just just don't overcrowd it um, and don't make it too um, unappealing to actually read, okay, or um, uh, to 
take the information in properly. It can be confusing for them. Um, and we're always to help. So if you're developing, whether it's electronic or paper, any kind of new template and you want some feedback on it, we are more than happy for you to pop it over and we'll have a little look through it. Um, that's me looking through it. Uh, and then just say, yeah, great. That, that, that information's great. Or you don't really need that. And it's taken up a fair bit of space. So rather than use that, why don't you put this information in there? OK, we we like to see what you guys are doing because it's interesting to us. And it helps me develop things like this because... You know, I remember the things I've seen and, yeah, we can deliver the information to the wider community, wider industry. So as a summary, then, um, always do a treatment report. I hope I've convinced you, you know, at the beginning there, um, um, it was, well, it was 81%, I think, said that you do one on every visit. Um, but those that 19% that doesn't do them at all or maybe does them just um, on the odd occasion, hopefully I've convinced you on why you should be doing it more often. Whether you're a BPCA member or not, um, obviously, if you are a BPCA member, we tell you you need to, OK? And we, we, we will, um, uh, I say, enforce these things. We work with you to get them done, but you do need to do one. But even if you're not a BPCA member, hopefully the things we've talked about, you kind of can see that, oh, it's, gonna, it's, it's, it's good for you as a business to do it and it protects you and it demonstrates that you're a professional, you know, puts you ahead of maybe your competitors as well. Um, you know, never overfill a report like I've just been talking about. Um, you know, get that sweet spot, sweet spot really. Um, could be some training that you can do in house with technicians, or if you're as an individual, give us a call and we can talk through it in a bit more detail. Um, you know, but also never part fill a treatment report because it doesn't look good. I've seen those before dealing with complaints and getting copies of treatment reports where you know there's uh the dates filled in but maybe the technician name's not filled in and you know the maybe the customer's name isn't filled in properly or um there's a section on actions taken that's been missed out and well, we must have done something you know so again you know not missing out information if you're writing a treatment report make sure you got it in. even if it's not applicable or actually it's something you don't need to fill in for whatever reason you know safety advice maybe you don't have any safety advice because you've just been given verbal advice um, to them just, just stay in there you know no safety advice required just yeah don't overfill it but don't underfill it okay it's helpful that isn't it <laughs> um uh, always leave obviously a copy with the relevant parties um you know so and it's so important i mentioned this because it's so common where you've got three customers you've got a paying customer you've got a tenant and you've got the pest controller that tenant that tenant is always um missed out if there is someone that's missed out, um, you know, the landlord is never missed out, of course, because they're the paying customer. But quite often um, we, we do see that that middle person is missed out. Now, again, if you're all going to ask any questions about um, what do we do if the landlord doesn't want you to give a copy, we'll see, won't we? Um, uh, but I've got 10, 15 minutes left, so I want to be able to get to your questions, of which I can see there's four. Um, and we say as well, keep records for two years. Um, that's a that's generally um, it's just a good guide to say after oh, two years I don't think you're going to get any inquiries about work that you've done um, with regards to there being a need to produce treatment reports from two years ago. Okay, um, just a guidance. Okay, there we go. A good timing. We've got um, ten or fifteen minutes left to do some questions, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, uh we've got 52 comments in chat hopefully we'll yeah saying nice things all right you know if you're not kind of like oh, he's babbling on again about risk assessments and treatment reports um if you are funny it's true i do that okay so um from anonymous here would uh what more would you be expected to include as a level three technician as opposed to a level two well, that's an obscure question okay i wasn't expecting that one um to be honest with you nothing i mean um so if you've got a, a level two technician and a level three technician and they're carrying out you know a rodent job in somebody's house standard you know day-to-day -day call outs that we get um you know the, the quality of information but it should be the same in there what maybe you might be referring to is what about someone who's got level three or maybe a biologist qualification and they're doing biologist visits or technical visits or quality assurance visits yeah you will provide more information um this webinar maybe i didn't you know maybe i should have mentioned that a bit more clearly you know this is about um you know 
um, day-to-day pest control, um, frontline technicians dealing with, you know, public health pests on a daily basis, treatment reports. Um, if you're doing biologist reports or technical reports or quality assurance reports, you will give more information, of course. Um, there'll be more images, there'll be more scientific names, there'll be more, you know, um, detailed advice or recommendation on uh, deep cleaning type stuff or long-term things to create long-term solutions. Um, so yeah, they they will be more detailed. I think that's what we're talking about. But you know, your day-to-day pest management, regardless of what qualification you've got, you know, it should still be of a of a similar quality. Okay. Um, hi, Natalie. Uh, hello, Andrew. Uh, we report on things we have, but what about things we haven't done for some reason? Is this something you recommend and have put into practice? So something you haven't done. Yeah, really good question. Um, so let me think of an example. Oh, if I can think of an example, that's on my feet type stuff, isn't it? Um, so yeah, if I went along to it, say, um, say a bed bug job, I don't know, and say I'm inspecting the property and uh, one room particularly is really messy and I can't seem to inspect it properly and I can't do a treatment properly because of the access issues, um, then yeah, you, you know, I'd put that in the treatment report. Um, you know, something that I haven't done, I haven't been able to inspect that area because I couldn't get access. Or if you've got you're investigating an issue with mice in a in a, a building and you think I want to look in that cupboard there because I want to see whether there's any activity, but you can't open that cupboard, put that in your treatment report because again, it's important. You know, the next time I don't know, a competitor can come along or an auditor can come along and say, why did the pest controller not go in that cupboard? There's a problem in there. It's ridiculous. They're not professional, clearly. Whereas if you've got it in your treatment report that, well, I did try and get in there, actually. But it wasn't open and there was no one here to open it for me. So it does protect you in that aspect. So good question, Andrew. Yeah, put anything that you couldn't do or didn't do or won't do for whatever reason and the whole, you know, possible um, scenarios that we could have in pest management. Yeah, put it in your treatment report. You know, again, you have to write War and Peace, um, other novels available, by the way. Um, but get it in there, write it down. Anything that you feel is valuable. Um, so, Rob, with things like wasp treatments, is it acceptable to put links to data, safety data sheets on the report, or should I be giving a hard copy of this? Some customers may only be one time visits, like wasp nest, for example. Yeah, again, really good question. Um, so information on the pesticide definitely needs to be given. I will never say don't bother giving them a safety data sheet. Um, apart from the fact that it's a very detailed, I say scientific document. Um, it's probably overkill. You know, it's, it's it's about, you know, everything from obviously first aid measures, but also to, you know, what the boiling point is or, you know, what hazard warning signs you have to carry on your vehicle if you're carrying, you know, over 500. There's a lot of information on there. And like I mentioned before, sometimes if you give too much information, it's just going to go over their head. Um, so, again, if anyone's got any counteracting arguments to this, um, the the preference is, is that on that treatment report, you've got, like I said, active ingredient, trade name, quantity and location, HSE number or BPR number, depending on, um, you know, whether it's which legislation it's under. Um, you can put that registration number on the treatment report as well so they can find it. Um, so, yeah, it's up to you. But I think sometimes it can be too much information you're providing the customer. OK. Uh, if you have site folders on contract sites, quite a common thing to find them in there. Um, because at least, um, you know, it's a, it's, you know where that information is. You can direct customers to it. It's not a stick in the drawer jobby just after you've done a, done a wasp nest. hope that makes sense. But there's no, there's no, yes, if you want to give them one, by all means, but still make sure that's on your treatment report. Uh, can we get some templates for reports, please? Yep, mentioned it um, before. We do. If you're not a BPCA member, um, then no, <laughs> uh, because it obviously it has our logo on there as well. So you do need to be a BPCA member to better don't download that. So um, please, you know, join us and we'll, we'll give you a copy. Uh, can we access these re recordings on the BPCA website later? Yep, mentioned that at the beginning. These uh, webinars, all of them, they're available for download after the event. Um, okay, so is it okay to do the treatment 
leave an info leaflet and then email a report sheet a sheet later that day really good question greg um greg so um if we're doing an assessment so if the beefs members we're doing an assessment we do require that information is left with the customer before you leave site um now you mentioned you've given me a bit of a curveball there saying well, what about we give them a a leaflet about the, the pesticides you could do that so another i don't want to i don't want to confuse anybody here this is relevant to your question block treatments where you've got 100 flats something you've done before um you've got maybe a housing association or a private landlord that owns them all and um you're doing treatments in 50 of those flats you know filling out a full treatment report for every single one of those customers in that that, that block of flats going to be pretty onerous and almost unrealistic so you could then develop say whether it's a leaflet greg or whether it's a, a flashcard type thing that you can just give this is the pesticide use this is the safety information this is the contact details you want your problems um and then you know it can be like a you know a smaller not that bit of paper because that's rubbish and looks rubbish but you know it can be rather than a, an a4 treatment report or electronic report full-on that you normally would use you can just develop something that's um still got that safety information so you do still need to deliver it um uh you can give it to them but going back to whether or not you can send a treatment report after you've left site for bbc members it really isn't something we um feel is beneficial for anybody and um we don't specifically refer to it in our codes but if you leave that site when a you may forget you might say no no chance nally ain't gonna forget but you may forget and then what happens you know an issue comes up and you're like oh my god i didn't send that treatment report so it's a bit risky um also something you know even if you do send it four hours later when you get home in that four hour period that you know, you, from when you left site to when you sent the report, what if they need some information on that that pesticide you've used? So it really needs to be, you need to have yourself set up so that you're able to give that information straight away. And again, Greg, if this leaflet gives pesticide information, safety information, then yeah, do you know what? Not a problem. You send them maybe other information later on, it, case by case, but just maybe have a think about all those things I just babbled on for for about three minutes. Um, hopefully that made sense there's quite a few more questions come through um and we've got a couple of minutes left but i'm gonna run over by five minutes i think we'll allow till 13 35 if everybody's happy to stick with me um to jonathan is there a way to uh police i'm oh, sorry is there a way to police report giving uh nine out of ten other companies haven't left any paperwork uh when oh, sorry, there's a lot of questions in here so um so yeah, I mean, in terms of HSC, so when do we get the HSC Bioside team involved? If any other company of core practice, there's a lot of questions there, Jonathan. Like, God, blimey, <laughs> separate them out for me. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, can you reword that for me, maybe, and, and, and post it down the bottom? I'm just not. Is there a way to please report giving? I'm not sure what that means. Um, and then some other comments there on HSC. Maybe that's a conversation we can have. Um, but yeah, certainly if there is misuse of pesticide, again, this is about treatment reports rather than that, um, then obviously the HSC are the ones that are the authority of pesticides, they're the ones to report it to. Uh, so yeah, sorry, Jonathan, I, I couldn't I couldn't kind of get exactly what, and I don't want to spend too much time with you watching me going, you know, reading in silence and trying to figure it out. But yeah, if you can reword that or give me a call afterwards. Um, uh, Hannah, so with data sheets, could we create our own with the important information relevant to the customer? So Hannah, you're talking about a cost assessment, absolutely. So a cost assessment is basically, you know, this is one water bottle, you've got your product, whatever that is, you know, Nat's bug spray, Natalie's bug spray, doesn't exist, haven't developed it yet, might do. Um, so you've got your product there, you've got your safety data sheet as well, sat there. And a cost assessment is basically you looking at the, the label on that product and the safety data sheet and developing a cost assessment, which combines it into a, a more condensed format with the most important information. And also that's a demonstration that you've looked at your product in depth. So if you manage people or you own your own company and um, you've got employees, then you've got a responsibility to keep them safe, which also means looking at the pesticide you've got 
doing a cost assessment on them and making sure they've got the right PPE, they've got the right first aid, you know, and that they've got the right training with that product as well. So what you've said there, yeah, you can create, your, not create your own safety data sheet, but you create your own cost assessment based on safety data sheet and product. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Rob. Yeah, good. No problem. Um, um, so recording waste removal on the report. So Malcolm, yes, you reminded me, of course. So things like when you're 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 dealing with rodents outside, um, and you're using rodenticide, possibly recording that you've searched for dead carcasses and removed said dead carcasses really important to protect you because as we know with the uh, you know secondary poisoning and everything going on in the industry at the moment you've got to demonstrate you're doing those things so a treatment report is not just um about you know the, the simple watch data it's, you know those, those actions there the legal requirement for you to do those things to check the dead bodies dead carcasses sorry um and uh if someone accuses you of not doing that if you haven't got it written down anywhere you know, so yeah, good point, Malcolm. Absolutely, uh, waste removal of carcasses, but also you know pesticide removal. If you've dealt with a problem and you're removing old rodenticide from site, you record that I've removed this rodenticide, pesticide, whatever, um, and you're using non-toxic. Everything you do that matters, you need to get on there. Thanks, Malcolm. Um, so Jonathan, you're just saying sorry. Don't say sorry. It's, it's me. It's my reading ability. Honestly, and under pressure and you know, I'm conscious of you all like looking at me like this, trying to like read the questions. So reword. So if another company hasn't captured anything in a report and poor practice is observed, what should we do as responsible businesses? Yeah, good question. Thank you. Understand now. <laughs> so yeah, if you if you and this is another point, come back to the beginning, you know, you're all you're all possibly going to see each other's treatment reports. So again, you want to do a good one. You want to have good information in there. Um but yeah, if you if you say, you know, you see a, a report or you don't see a report or something that hasn't been captured or poor practice, um, you could, if they're a BCA member, come and have a chat to us about it. Um, certainly if it's, um, I mean, you know, I don't want to talk about illegal things, you know, if you feel there's illegal things happening. And of course, there'll be authorities that you can you can go to to report that to, be it HSC or the police, be it, you know, animal welfare or misuse of pesticides. But we are always a good option to come and talk to, even if it's a, a non-BBCA member and you just want to get some advice because you're a member. Yeah, you know, um, we, we can go through that with you. Um, but certainly if it's a BBCA member um, and we always look to deal with things like that in the um, most amicable way possible and educational way possible, because I've certainly made mistakes in the past. You know, when I first started, um, I look back and I think, yeah. Maybe you shouldn't have used that product in that way. Maybe I should have read the label more often. All these things, um, I know I should have done better. Um, but all it took was someone to tell me to do it better and me to watch things like webinars and go, there's a better way of doing that. That's my real passion in this is that, you know, we all make mistakes. We maybe all leave things out that we shouldn't leave out. Um, and, it, and it's OK. Um, there's obviously nothing bad goes wrong and you end up somewhere in court or you shouldn't be. But you know, just recognize it. You know, we like to help people recognize something that they, they're doing that they shouldn't be doing or not doing something they should be doing and um, helping them through it. So please come to us first. Um, we can hopefully get it sorted in a positive way. And then um, if there's any issues after that, of course, we can. Yeah, there's authority you can go to. OK, good. So oh, look, 1334. I was right. I thought it would take me five minutes over. Um, good. I am going to leave it there. So if you do have any more questions, just pop them through technical at bbca.org.uk. Um, don't think I've forgotten anything else. And yeah, thanks for listening, really. And we'll see you hopefully on the uh, next webinar in September on mouse control, which you'll see me. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye bye.